I guess we'll go ahead and get started. They wanted to wait a little bit for some of the, uh, the traffic to get up the escalators. Um, kind of starting off today, uh, I was kind of wanting to get a feel for what type of websites you guys are working with. Uh, boy, this, I'm not going to be able to walk around with that. I think I'll not use the mic. Um, if anyone can't hear me, let me know, and I'll go back to using the mic. Um, but I don't think I want to be stuck at a podium the whole time. Um, so I want to kind of get an idea of what kind of websites people are building. Um, so how many people are building nonprofit websites? Oh, good number. About 40%. How many people are building business websites? Okay. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of people are building multiples. How many people are sort of managing a website versus how many people, how many people are managing websites? And from the sense that you are the owner of the website or working for the company who owns the website. Okay, how many people are agencies or consultants and so forth? Okay, so a good mix there. Um, how many people are working publishing websites, content publishers and so forth? A decent number. Okay. All right. That, that kind of helps. Uh, one of the tricky things about uh, how intelligence works is it's different depending on what your goals are. Different types of websites will have different types of goals. Um, so I want to talk to you guys about something actually I'm, I'm really excited about. It's what I sort of see as the future of the web. Um, and it's something that we call intelligent websites. And so, you know, what is an intelligent website? Well, really intelligence is just sort of a system that starts to integrate in data and analytics and other types of metrics to help people make better decisions. So it's not just about managing content, it's about data that can help us do things better, engage, our, engage visitors better, create better content, and so forth. And really in many ways, I think it's interesting the way we build what the traditional websites build. It's almost sort of like building this robot that you send out to the world, and you have no feedback to know if it's actually succeeding. Um, you don't know if it's just out there bumping into walls. And so really, it's, you, know, you wouldn't see a, a biological system like this. You wouldn't see a mechanical system like this. But we all have feedback mechanisms. We can touch and we can do things that as we do things, our brain then knows if we're doing it right or how to adjust and those kinds of things. That's really what an intelligence system is about. And so over the years, um, I, do, I work for a company called Level 10 um, and we've been around about 50, a little over 15 years and we've gotten a lot of questions. In fact, in the early days we actually did a lot of usability work, um, mainly in the banking world. Um, when uh, people didn't really know how to put together an online banking website. So you go and prototype sites out and you would videotape people and so forth. Well, now we do a lot of building with heuristics. So rules of thumb, a bunch of experts get together, they wireframe things out. It's a very efficient way of working. Um, it definitely doesn't require the huge budgets that some of those projects did back in the 90s, but it comes to a lot of questions. You know, everything from um, what kind of content, uh, what type of, uh, on what kind of uh, content terms are our visitors interested in? To flat menus versus drop down menus versus mega menus. We keep having this conversation. Um, oh, it seems like over and over again. You know, there's all kinds of these little things, and a lot of times we think we know what the best thing is, but we don't really always have the data to back it up. And so we want to solve this problem, but ultimately, well, we're wanting to answer all different types of questions. There's three main questions we're trying to answer with a system like intelligence. The first one is, when we make a change to the website, do we have a positive or negative effect? Because again, well, most of it's just based on heuristics. And a lot of times it's actually, for if you're in professional services, it's based on the client um, who may not necessarily have a huge background and come to conferences like this. It's sort of what they want. They saw the latest cool thing on some other website. Well, when we implement that, does it really have a positive or negative effect? The second thing we're trying to do, and this is something that's always fascinating me, it's the Pareto Principle. Um, and many, many years ago, uh, when we were less on the marketing side, I heard a marketer tell me um, at, a, at a conference I was at that we know that 80% of our results come from 20% of our efforts. The problem is we don't know what 20%. And so one of the things I want, I've always wondered is what if we could know the 20% and could focus on that side of things? So that's another part we want to do. And then another area, and this does get a little fuzzy, but I hope that it's a way to help people ask the most elusive question in marketing. Um, it's not all about marketing, but the most elusive question of marketing is what's our ROI? Uh, you know, I'll go to say social media conferences and things like that, and whenever anyone brings up ROI, there's always kind of this hand wavy, well, we really don't know what the ROI is. I'm like, why not? The web's very measurable. Why, why can't we figure out what the ROI is? Or at least come up with a good estimated guess to get in the ballpark. So, as an intelligence system, um, really I see there's kind of two sides to what we're trying to do. One side is about behavior. What are people actually doing on the website? And when we make changes, what kind of changes in behavior are we seeing? The other side is identity. Who are the people coming to our website? What can we learn about them? 
Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, if you're kind of building your websites properly, you start out you're building personas and all these kinds of things. What if we can actually start to understand when people come to the website which personas they fit into? Um, or other things, such as uh, are they, what's their clout score, and are they an influencer, and so forth. The, the, my, kind of, my kind of goal with a system like this goes back to a book I read several years ago um, called The Fifth Discipline. Anyone ever read The Fifth Discipline? Nobody. Okay, I'd recommend reading it. It's a good book. Um, it, is, it is a bit academic, um, and it's kind of one of the most typical business books where it's kind of making the same point over and over again for a while. Um, but in general, it's a very good book. It's actually written by the guy um, who used to be the director of MIT's Institute for Memory, um, um, for mem uh, what is it? Memory and Learning, Learning Now. Um, and his, his uh, hypothesis is that the most important thing organizations need to do to be competitive is to learn faster than other organizations. And so his passion and, and the whole uh, the institute that um, he directed at MIT was all about how do we create better learning organizations. And really came up with five, five core, uh, core components to a great learning organization. The first one's personal mastery. Basically, you have people that are interested in learning. Um, pretty straightforward. Second one is mental models. And again, this goes back to this heuristic, those rules of thumb. These are things that we believe to be true. So um, responsive design. Is, is more valuable than non, or different things like that. Well, great organizations actually challenge these mental models on a regular basis. That's why we see like a lot of big companies stop innovating, because they have these ingrained mental models, and they stop challenging them, and just kind of keep going down the same path. Third one is uh, shared vision. So that as a group, we need to be working to learn together, and we need a shared vision towards doing that. The fourth is team learning, people collaborating, um, people sharing and dialoguing information. And really, most good learning organizations, they have these four. The fifth one is the one that the book's about, and the one that's actually the most elusive, and it's systems thinking. Um, this is really developing conceptual framework for um, under thinking of things as in, in, in systems terms. And so what I actually thought was interesting, probably one of the reasons I gravitate towards this book, is I'm actually a chemical engineer by education. And I've always wondered why like, people don't really, like I think most engineers who are trained in process control um, and systems thinking and so forth. And I, realized, I don't think really any other discipline is. I mean, we had you know a few electrical engineers that were in our that were in our process controls class, but I don't really know how many. I don't know if computer scientists actually get into process control because this is something that's kind of natural. You take a you know you think of a system as a box. It has inputs. You can measure those inputs. You have an output, and how do you adjust those inputs to change what you're getting on your outputs? Um, and so this is actually what they talk about is something that's, that's significantly missing. In fact. There's an interesting experiment they talk about at the beginning of the book, and you can look it up online. Um, there's something called the beer game. And so the beer game is sort of this game. They actually do this with MIT, incoming MIT um, MBAs. And they break everybody up into four groups. One group is a, is a wholesaler of beer, or is a retailer of beer, another is a wholesaler, another is a distributor, another is a manufacturer. And they all have to do orders, where they pass orders back and forth in paper, and you get docked points if you accumulate inventory, um, or if you can't beat custard man, and things like that. And out of all the people who do it, only 5% of teams actually achieve an optimal, an optimal rate because they're not applying systems thinking. There's not these feedback loops that they need to understand. They just see how they're, how they're doing things from their point of view, not how the entire system is performing as a whole. And so this is one of the things that we want to implement with a, with a website intelligence system. So you know, the interesting thing, of course, is I'm sure you're thinking, well, there is the analytics. How many people are running analytics on their website? How many people have looked at their analytics in the last month? Ah, pretty good. Much better, much better than a normal group, smart group. How many people have their uh, goals set up in Google Analytics? Ah, decent numbers, more better than the average. Um, how many people are having their developers and content people and um, their creative designers looking at their analytics? Wow, very sharp group, cool. Actually, when I ask that question in most places, very few people have looked at their analytics. I'd say normally less than 5% have looked at their analytics in the last month. But it, there's still, you know, so we're starting to think about like, why is an existing analytics system sufficient enough to give people the feedback they need to build better websites? But I think the first problem is, is that you have to measure what you value. And so most people, when they look at analytics, they just go, well, I'm getting this much traffic, or these pages are getting so much traffic, um, or this many page views. That's not a particularly meaningful measure. Um, now, of course, if you're implementing goals, which is great, it looks like a decent number of you guys are implementing goals. Again, that's something that you find very few people are doing. 
um, it's a wonderful tool. Now you start to get into more, we can measure things that are of value. And that'll change from site to site. If you're an e-commerce site, it might be someone purchasing something. Um, if you're a, uh, if you're a, a B2B, it might be generating leads or, or what have you. We also found that there's actually kind of a whole category of things that when people are setting up their goals, they're missing. And it's mainly engagement. Things like who's sharing content, who's commenting, who's playing videos, who's doing these things. And actually, Google Analytics isn't particularly well set up for this. It actually has a mechanism for doing it, but it doesn't push any of that data automatically. You have to have your website push that data. So one of the first things we wanted to do is we wanted to set up a system to push extra events. And there are some basic things you can do, say, the Google Analytics module in Drupal, such as like if someone clicks a certain link out of a site, but really, those were the types of things that are, that are kind of easy to do weren't things that we really wanted to measure. We wanted to measure more things like who's engaging with our content, who's clicking on calls to actions, what landing pages are converting, whether they're converting ratios and things like that. And so we need a system that pushes a lot more, uh, a lot more events over into Google Analytics. And I'll say, um, when we started to build the system, I was planning on, there's actually an analytics system that we built years ago. Um, but then as I started looking to Google Analytics, I realized, oh, there's actually a whole bunch of untapped features in Google Analytics. Um, and so then we decided just to piggyback the system on top of Google Analytics and push a lot more data and then pull a lot, and I'll, I'll kind of show you the second half of it later. Um, so then, of course, we need a way to manage different types of events. And of course, that's the great thing about a content management system. It gives us a way that we can set up and say, okay, well, we want to create this event that we now want to push over to Google Analytics. All that kind of stuff happens in JavaScript. But we don't have to be dealing with JavaScript all the time in order to just for, say, if someone wants to measure something in particular. So we can set all that kind of stuff up in the Drupal admin. Um, and then, you know, some of the things I think are really interesting to monitor are things like call, uh, CTA uh, click-through rates, um, landing page conversions. And so something we might want to do is that whenever a CTA, a call to action, so these are like these little graphics that might be, hey, click over here to download this ebook or donate to our, you know, donate to our cause or you know, even sign up for the website. Well, we don't know how many times are these being shown versus how many times they're being clicked through. And so if we push a, here's an impression event every time it's shown, and then every time someone clicks on it, we push a, uh, a click through, and then they go to a landing page, and then we can do something like push a landing page view, which are sort of these numbers, and then you can look at how many times they actually submit, which then would create a CTA conversion and a landing page conversion. So we start to get an idea of um, what, what calls to actions and what landing pages are converting the best, even doing A-B testing and putting ones that are similar but changing certain things to find out which ones we're getting the best performance from. Now, a second challenge that we found with traditional analytics is that um, particularly once we've gone and set up a bunch of extra events that we're pushing over into it, is that there is uh, currently with Google Analytics, there's over 200 different data points. And a lot of people don't really, the question kind of comes up, one of the ones I love is time on site. Um, there's a lot of people who go, oh, we want to increase our time on site, but we've actually found through usability, we actually decrease time on site, which is not a bad thing. People found what they're looking for faster. Um, and so there's a lot of these metrics, it's hard to say, like, what does it really worth? And so in, in economics, there's actually a pretty good mechanism for dealing with this situation. When you have all these different products, um, and you're trying to understand like what's more valuable, what types of things we want to produce more of, and it's, and it's a, a, a concept called utility. Um, and basically the way utility works, it's almost a little bit like money in some ways, except money is a bit of a flawed mechanism for, for dealing with a situation like this. But it's almost saying if you were to have an orange and you were to have an apple, and you would like both in the same, you'd say, okay, both represent one utility as, as a unit. And then you can do things like, well, if you had two apples, would you want a half orange? And you actually start to create these in different curves as you understand the type of utility that different products create. And so we wanted to apply this basically to come up with a single number. Instead of having to look at 200 some different data points, I want to look at a single number to know are we doing better or are we doing worse? This is great for managers. The, the analysts will want to go deeper than that, but the number's great, uh, is a great measure for people that want to do a quick look. And so what we, what we want to do is set up something where we can measure things like traffic. Um, so like out of the, out by default, um, we'll do something like every, time, every visitor we have is worth .05. Um, if someone sticks on the website, in other words, they don't leave, they hit a second page, that's now worth .1 to us. Um, and every page they hit after that is .02. Um, then we can start scoring events. Every time someone shares a piece of content, say on Twitter or Facebook, that's worth five to us. Uh, if someone comments, it might be worth 10. Um, we can value things like if people are clicking back from, from social media and so forth. And then you've got your goals. 
So goals are if someone submits this form over here, normally it's a conversion thing, might be an e-commerce or buying something. Um, how much are those things worth? So we start to select certain data points and say every time we get one of these, it's worth so many points. And we'll see like how that number gets used uh, a little bit later on. One of the other challenges that we found, actually, that was actually really impressive, people are actually logging into Google Analytics and looking at their stuff, or, or whatever analytics package they're using, because that's another challenge we found. It's this other system over here. Um, and while you know, normally there's a marketing manager or someone similar content, you know, someone who's maybe doing content that's looking at it on a regular basis, generally people don't look at this data. So one thing we felt was really important to build a great system for, uh, for, that, for creating systems thinking was to bring that data where people were living. People are logging into the content management system on a regular basis. So we want to weave analytics data in so that people are seeing it. So for example, this is uh, a typical, um, uh, just a, a standard um, Drupal content admin, but we're hooking in and pulling data out of the analytics. And remember when I was talking about the scoring? That's where these numbers come from. Trying to get people away from thinking about entrances and page views and towards value. Uh, we'll still talk about interests and views because they're fun, but we like these are the things that are really important. And so one of the things we're doing here is uh, we're saying, okay, we're going to score all these different things. And so this page here, how much value is it driving per day? Um, and then we actually have a threshold that says if it's above a certain amount, it's green. If it's below a certain amount, it's red. And if, otherwise, it's yellow. Um, but so that when people ever go to the admin page, they now see, oh, we had that blog post I wrote last week. Oh, it's scoring. It's scoring um, you know, in this area. The other thing we want to do is that on every node, we want to put an analytics tab so that when people are creating content, um, and you know more and more what you're seeing is particularly you know in say B two Bs, you've got engineers and you've got other like subject matter experts that are creating content, not necessarily expert writers, um, but we want to give them ways to understand what type of engagement's going on with their content. So let's give them an analytics tab, and so I, uh, I'll show you a little bit what's in a second what's behind the analytics tab. Um, but another quick example is just looking at form submissions. Um, so like one of the challenges we have, uh, this is actually some of the stuff we built for, specifically for our website. Uh, one of the challenges we have is that we tend to work in a local area, Texas for the most part. Um, and so we want to know how many people, when they're submitting a form, are they actually local to us? Uh, and so we and so because it's kind of a, just looking at the forms that are being submitted and integrating that data in from Google Analytics. So the other thing that I want to do, and another challenge that I found with, with Google Analytics is there's a lot of great data, but it has to be pieced together. Um, and you find yourself like there's, there's some, some people you know, who, that we work with sometimes that work at big agencies, and they get paid big bucks to spend a lot of time putting a lot of spreadsheets together. Because they can't get all the data they need in a single report. And so that's one of the other things we want to do is we want to say, well, we want to, we want to get some comprehensive views. So for example, you know, talking about that analytics tab, this is what we want behind that tab. So we can see traffic, we can see what types of events are happening. So this would be a typical blog post. So we'd say, hey, this blog post has gotten 10 social shares, it's gotten one comment, it's gotten one CTA click. Um, no, one has con no one has converted from this form, but if they had, it would show up here. Um, and then this is actually sort of more of a downstream. So like after they left that page, did they share something else? And this is the bottom of this page. It's kind of a long page, so I chopped it here. And so then over here is all the different traffic sources. So where are we getting traffic from? Um, did this thing get picked up by Reddit or by StumbleUpon? Or you know, where, where might be getting traction? Or the search engines pick it up? And we're getting some traffic from there. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is maybe we want to do a deeper dive. So for example, we're getting a lot of social traffic. Maybe we want to understand it. So there's actually a whole series of reports that are all focused around this one particular node that allows us to understand better different components of what's going on with this specific page. One of the other things that we find interesting, so you know, it's great that one of the first things we did was implement the whole kind of system where you could see pages and you could see scoring, but then people started asking sort of like why. You know, the last report was showing things like um, the why as far as this happened and this point happened, but we want to understand trends across, like why was this page actually creating better engagements? And a lot of times it's hard to tell from a single page. And so a mechanism that we wanted to use is segmentation. So that we look at a larger set of pages and group them together and see what their performance was. Um, and of course, what's great about a content management system like Drupal is it gives you all the mechanisms for doing that. So for example, we can group things together by we want to look at all our different content types. How are they performing compared to each other? And of course, you then click into something like blog posts and then look at all the blog posts filtered out from all the other types of pages. Or maybe we want to look at authors. 
What authors are creating the most engaging content? Um, and so we can score them based on a sum of how all the pages they're publishing are performing. Another one is taxonomy. Um, so, you know, what terms are performing the best? And so there's all kinds of tools of doing that. Um, organic groups might be another one. Uh, so that um, you, you can say which groups are, you know, sort of creating the most value, most traffic, and so forth. <coughs> and so, you know, one of the things we want to do is have a whole way of creating these segments. Um, again, Google Analytics supports this stuff, but you still have to push it from the content management system. You've got to have a way of, you know, sending all that information over. And so we wanted a way to organize it. So it's so kind of a typical thing, you know, so we'll set up authors, content types, entity types, publish time. It's actually kind of one of, it's kind of allows you to do some pretty interesting things so you can compare, like, how did this blog post do in its first 30 days versus how did this one do in its first 30 days? It's not quite fair to compare them when one's pretty old and one's new. Um, so then you know, people can kind of add what they want uh, to be able to do various different types of uh, page attributes. What, so then one of the other areas that I think is important, so you know, there's a lot of things you can do with content, but we also want to do a lot of things around visitors. Um, so one thing that uh, I want to be able to do is to be able to track visitors as they went around our website. So what happens is when someone comes to the website, they're still anonymous. We don't actually know who they are. You know, we don't have a name for them. We don't have an email address, anything like that. But we can look at what they're doing when they go around the website. I actually really like this from a usability standpoint. Because in call centers, we always have this problem um, where you know, someone would be confused on the website. They'd call the, 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 uh, the rep. And the rep wouldn't really, we always try to like figure out like what was it you were doing? Um, they had to manually explain it. Well, what we want to do is cr uh, create click streams. So we're tracking every page hit that people are doing, all the events they're doing, and then based on the, uh, the token that they're being tracked with, we can reconstruct their path through the website. And we can reconstruct as their months have passed as long as they haven't cleared out their cookies. Um, so as long as Google Analytics can track it, then we can track and know what are people doing. Um, even kind of did a fun little, fun little um, timeline so you kind of like, you know, get the little screen grab and all that kind of stuff so you get kind of a more, like, what did they, what did they kind of experience as they went through the website. Um, and of course, so then, just like we had, we had a way of setting up page segmentation, we want a way to set up visitor segmentation. So as people are moving to the website, we want to understand things like, what are they interested in? Uh, maybe we give them a score. If, say, you're a B2B, you might want to do a lead score. Uh, or maybe uh, one of the ones actually, actually kind of like we just did recently, is a job candidate score. So if people are applying with us, we want to know, did they look through our blog? What types of blog posts were they reading? What videos were they playing? Um, you know, things along those lines, or do they just kind of come to our website, you know, submit an application and so forth. Um, and so we want a way of understanding as people are doing various things on the website, um, what it is they're doing. And then what gets really fun is when someone finally goes ahead and submits a form. Uh, so it might be a web form, we also integrated with HubSpot and a few others. Um, because then we can start summing all this data together. Um, so we take you know, data from Google Analytics, their location, their browser, information from, say, web form, like when they were submitting. Um, we take their email address and ping it against a service like Full Contact, and we might be able to figure out like what their cloud is, what their uh, uh, LinkedIn is, you know, some of those things. So now we can understand a lot better who this person is, maybe customize content to them. Um, push, so if we've monitored what types of things they're interested in, push that information into, say, MailChimp or what have you, and then we can do emails around their specific interests. Um, so that is kind of, that, like I said, this is, uh, this is kind of a project we've been working on for about a year um, to help build more intelligent websites. Um, what time is it? I'm going to have a challenge that I won't be able to demo this with this projector. I did bring another projector. Oh, we have time for it. Um, does anyone have any questions? So the data that you're storing looks like a lot of it's coming out of Google Analytics, but I'm assuming you're storing a lot in your own tables for your module as well. <coughs> Sure. Um, yeah, actually kind of the way it works is when someone's anonymous, pretty much all the data is being stored in Google Analytics. So it doesn't take up like, because otherwise you, know, you, you could have insane amounts of data sitting in your Drupal site. Um, and there's really, and, and so the thing is you can't actually push anything in Google Analytics that has personal identifiable information. So you can't push an email or a name or anything like that to Google Analytics. You can push an, a, a, you know, a hashtag. So that allows it to seam everything back together. So basically, when people are an anonymous visitor, pretty much everything is being tracked through um, through Google Analytics. There's a couple exceptions for a few scenarios. 
Um, but that's mostly what happens. Then when someone submits a form, still all the analytics stuff is going to Google Analytics, but now there is data sitting in Drupal. What actually then ends up happening is it triggers a process where um, sort of the hook process that says, what modules have you enabled? What am I synced with? So like a typical scenario might be hook, uh, syncing with HubSpot um, at full contact, which is like a part of our API, uh, full contact and MailChimp. So the first thing it does is, okay, I've got this person, I've got an email address. I'm gonna go hit all these different sources. What data do you have for me? Um, or even LinkedIn or what have you. What data do you have for me? And it pulls that all back. And then after it turns through it, it saves it, saves it in Drupal, and Drupal sort of ends up acting. There's an entity called an Intel Visitor. Um, so it actually ends up being sort of the central store for the data, but then it'll push it back out to any of those platforms. Um, so like a, like a good scenario, like something I found kind of annoying with HubSpot is that you can't, you don't know someone's location um, unless they actually fill out a form. And I'm like, well, we have that data sitting in Google Analytics. So we use that process like, hey, pull the, pull the address and same thing with MailChimp. Um, you know, I wanna, and now when I push this data back out, I wanna push their address. I wanna push where they're located, geolocation information, so that way we have it. Um, the other things like we'll push is things like you know a lead score mechanism or something like that. So now in say HubSpot we've got a lead score to work off of so that we can kind of evaluate what types of mailings we're doing and so forth. So a combination of the three systems. Story. Yeah, it's kind of a combination. Exactly, it's kind of a combination of all three. Um, uh, any other questions? This may be better to do. I'll see how well this works. Um, so we have a we've we've got a, a, a booth down um, down the exhibit area. We've got kind of like a whole like six screen monitor set up done. Where one of the things I kind of did I did because a lot of times when we're demoing this, people think the whole real time analytics thing and, and Google Analytics is really cool, but it's actually not very useful. Um, so actually for uh, for the conference. Um, I kind of did a little proof of concept of a real-time dashboard um, that, that's much more in-depth than what you can get with Google Analytics. And so we've got kind of a whole full demo, but I'll kind of show you kind of a short version of what that might look like if I can get this projector set up. The only problem is it needs a big screen, or it needs a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. We are, well, okay, that, great question. Um, so there actually is a free version of this out on Drupal.org. Um, so it's a little bit like Mullum, where you, there's an API key, but there's a free API key. Um, and with the free version, it actually will do all the stuff around content. What you don't get is all the visitor stuff, because that is the stuff that you we actually you know, need to do a bunch of data storing and so forth around. Um, and so what we're doing, and then the, the the, what we call the pro version of the service, which gives, gives the full access to everything. At some point, we are going to be selling that um, as, a, as a, you know, kind of like just a monthly fee, sort of like Mullen, you know, kind of like a monthly fee. Um, at this point, it's still in beta, and, you know, something we're using with our clients. What we are doing, though, is we have a uh, offering that we're doing um, called the r, r reports. And so what that will end up being is that you'll get the, the full system, um, and then we'll produce a report, like we'll kind of look over the data, because that's the other thing we're trying to get a better handle on. It's been built around sort of like content marketers. A lot of it has, but then we've, you know, we've got a couple clients that are doing things like communities, and they want to understand more. And so we're trying to get a better handle on the different types of things, different types of websites need, um, and what reports, because you can kind of build reports forever on this thing. Um, and so we're, we're going to be doing this R&R this &R report, which is not going to be, I think the, the starting price is going to be like 600 uh, a month, so it'll be you know, fairly expensive. We'll spend an hour and a half, we'll, we'll kind of give you all the recommendations on how to set it up, like what taxonomies you want to follow, how you want to set up all your content types and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then spend, you know, an hour and a half each month kind of putting together a report, pulling out like kind of the important things to look at. Because that's another thing that, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, some people said, like, I just don't have time to look at more data. If someone could do that for me, 
Um, and so that's why, you know, that's why we're kind of like looking to go down, go down that route. And so we'll probably, I'm hoping to get it out of, I'm hoping to get the pro version out of beta in the next six months. Um, one of the challenges is we keep coming up with new ideas for it. So the, the beta works pretty well. Um, I just don't know if we're quite ready to have you know millions of hits against the thing. Um, hey Tom, you addressed this a little earlier. Sorry if I missed it, but um, does this help with the fact that Google's not showing a lot of the keyword information and stuff like that coming in? Because you know, that's been a big issue. Yeah. Oh, Google Analytics, no, you can't get it unless you use AdWords. Yeah. So. No, it does not. They cannot solve that. <laughs> that would require a special type of mojo. Um, yeah, no, in fact, actually, that was something I was really upset about because literally like three weeks before they stopped doing it, I actually put like a whole JavaScript thing in that would like tell you like what, what ranking you were and what keyword and all that kind of stuff. And then like they removed it, I'm like, darn it. It actually wasn't that hard to write that piece of JavaScript. But um, yeah, yeah, I wish it could. Now, what's interesting though, I have seen some people talk about like, Kind of like ways to kind of like get to some idea of what it is. So one thing it does do is it does push the terms that could be on a page. In fact, one thing one thing we've done for one of our clients is um, we use the alchemy module to kind of extract terms and then push those terms. So you're sort of like taking a guess, but it's still not really saying like where you're ranking or anything like that. But it gives you some idea. Do you have any plans for like uh, partner or affiliate reseller type? We do. Okay. Yes, and that's actually a big a big part of it. So. This stuff, and along with our distribution, Open Enterprise, we've been ser selling as kind of our secret sauce to our clients. But as we've been showing this to a lot of people, they're like going, we'd really like, and it's kind of more showing it to like some other agency owners and like that, just to kind of get their opinion and feedback, you know, a bunch of smart guys. And then when several people start asking us, like, could we license this, or could we do whatever? And so yes, we are doing a partner program. Uh, in fact, we're, we're basically kind of launching it here at DrupalCon. The, probably the best thing to do is talk to us down, talk to us down at our, our table, um, uh, there's some other people that will be a little bit better to talk, I mean, I can talk about it, but there'll be some other people who will be a little bit better to talk to about it than, than I will be. Um, okay. Now, of course, the death of, that is not the most, that is not the most online screen in the world, but let's try this. That's a pretty good, pretty good picture. Right, to the right, to the right. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, I probably shouldn't think that. All right, well, let's close up. You get the idea. Now, of course, the always dangerous, scary thing of any, <laughs> any <laughs> an actual live demo. <laughs> um, on kind of a thing that was a proof of concept. But... So, and so what we're going to be actually looking at what this is. is this is actually a real-time demo. What I like about this is actually kind of easier for people to understand how the data is getting assembled, how it's getting used. Um, pardon? It is actually not. If I had time to learn, if I understood Josh, Josh could charge my head. Um, I still don't, the, the, this thing keeps messing me up. Um, what? It's just straight up G4. No, no, I know it. It's, no, 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 it says how to build a panel. Oh, how to build it. Okay, the panel itself, okay, that's a great. Okay, another good question. Why well, won't it go in chaos mode? Timeline JS. Actually, it is. Yeah, there's timeline JS. Uh, with a bit of hacking as well. Mm -hmm. There's some annoying bugs in it. Um, and there's really no good way to hack it. I mean, you have to hack it. Yeah. There's no way to hook into it. So, um, and you're right, yeah, that is timeline JS, um, which is actually in the main system too. That's kind of, it's just a fun JavaScript, uh, fun JavaScript thing to kind of click, click streams. Um, so what I like about, one of the things I like about the real time, the, the real time dashboard is actually kind of, you can kind of get a better idea of how this data is coming together. Um, so let's say for example, I'm, well, I was hoping to have two screens to do this. I will probably pull out my iPad to do the navigating around the website. Maybe you can list any one and do that also. Um, I couldn't find 
out to wait, did this thing automatically connect to the I guess it did. Automatically connected to the Wi-Fi. Hmm. Well, and actually somebody's on it. So um, this is actually a live website. So and we might be demoing it downstairs or actually we do get some search engine traffic to it. So um, so actually what, what's going on here is this actually is three three visitors have come to this. And it might have been when I, I probably one of them was when I went there to, to log in. Um, and so each time um, So let's say, so this is just kind of a, this is just to kind of simulate a refer coming from external. So let's say someone said, hey, I want to go and learn more about mobile design. Um, so now that was off the website. So this is now on a website that's being monitored by intelligence. Um, It's a little small to read, but so this is the hit that just came in. Um, and then what it did was this one hit, remember we said that it's worth 0 0.5? So what ended up happening is that whatever the traffic source was, um, that it got increased by, point, uh, by point 0 0.05. Um, and then it breaks down into campaigns, keywords, whatever else might be tracked. Then the page that got hit, it got a point 0 0.05. But that page also pushed um, a bunch of other data. It's way too small to read, but it pushed that it's a blog post. It pushed that the author was Kyle, um, that, that the uh, past uh, the two taxonomy terms, um, and yeah, someone's on the site. So, um, but anyway, so it passed all those taxonomy terms. So what happens is all of those things, Kyle is an author. He, he gets bumped up 0 0.05. Uh, I think usability, UX, and um, development were both as taxonomy terms. So both of them get bumped up 0 0.05. The, the visitor, which is the people over here, that person gets bumped up uh, 0 0.05. And then, of course, the whole site. Now, as if I hit a second page, um, then all those things will all get bumped up by, by, uh, by 10 cents. Or if you go and do something like, Or if you do something like, okay, well, I want to share on Twitter. So that's actually this orange piece. That's basically saying we've got a value event that just came through. Actually, all these other events that are coming through, these are blue. Uh, Google visualization does some odd things in animate mode. We start getting a lot of lines on there. Um, but. Uh, so you start to see that, uh, so we can see that, you know, that got pushed through, and of course it shows up underneath the events that we now got a social share. Um, I shared on Twitter, and so when this rotates through, it'll say, yeah, we've got to share, we've got to share through Twitter. Um, and then we might have something where the person, they click on, uh, they click on this call to action. And you actually kind of say, if you saw the color real quick, it actually kind of bumped up that we just hit a landing page. Um, so we triggered it. Now we've hit, we've hit a landing page. The CTA click comes through. Um, actually, it looks like we've got a ton of people on the website. So this will make for a very <laughs> difficult. Should have put up a different website for this. Um, okay, that's actually pretty psychedelic. Yeah, I'll say this. We did a whole lot of testing with a whole lot of people on the website. Um, and if I can find my user, I can actually keep him selected. Actually, I 
I think this is my user right here. Right. Okay. Let's see if we back up. Yeah, there's a social share. There's the entrance. Okay. So you know, like that's how the click streams work. Um, so now I was okay. Someone asking about how this specifically put together. What this is actually doing, I was originally hoping to use Google Analytics actually has a real-time API, it's a beta. I was hoping to use that originally, but then I realized I'm gonna go over, there's API limits, and I wouldn't have been able, I wanted more like a five second polling rate, and I would have burned through like our daily allowance of API calls. So what I ended up actually doing to make this work is I'm echoing all the data that goes into Google Analytics, basically back to a simple little log. It doesn't actually run through Drupal, um, although I'm storing the Drupal database, but I don't have to. Um, it's just kind of a simple little API that just stores log items. And then this is a whole JavaScript thing. It just grabs it and kind of assembles all the data um, that are needed for all the different reports. That, that's how this thing gets built. And then things are kind of fun like um, this. These two things down here, these are actually coming from Addis. Um, the Addis API will actually tell you where, uh, when people share stuff. Uh, so it's kind of neat. It's like, you know, Addis is on about 10 million websites. And so when people are sharing, it keeps a profile of who that person, who, what that person shares on. And if you implement the Addis API, they'll let you have that data. You just gotta tap into their JavaScript API. So that's one of the things we save. This is actually not Google Analytics. This is actually coming from Addis. Um, just because Google Analytics takes a little bit more work to get the data back out. Um, so, that, so they've got a bit, a bit more of a real time. Although what I found with Addis is sometimes I think they're kind of keeping like where you log in the most not necessarily where you're logged in currently right now. So like, you know, if you live, like I noticed yesterday when I was logging in, it still had to be in Dallas. Um, so I think what it's trying, it's basically it's like, where, I, where am I normally, not where I am right now, where Google Analytics is, where am I right now? So you kind of two different pieces of data. Um, but so anyway, so as we're moving through the website, as we hit things, you know, we're pushing that data, and then the visitor is also having, it's a little small to see, and again, you guys really want to see it. There's a great, the demo is very visible, very easy to see um, that we've got downstairs. But you see that now these points are starting to add up on this, on this user. So this user has a user experience of one, um, an interest in user experience of one, an interest of development of one. As we say, hit other blog posts or hit other things on the page, we can increase those number, decrease them, you know, as we see fit. Um, so, you know, that's how, like I said, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to demo with all these people on site. But um, anyway, uh, so, but... Please come down and see the booth. Uh, I think it's kind of a cool, cool monitor setup. Um, plus, if you want to see like six screens, everyone know how to do that because I've tried several different ways to get that to work. <laughs> so, are there any other, any other questions? Yeah, Doug. So, can I assume this is going to be rules aware and I can show that when it wants to people based on the screen? It does have some rules awareness now. Um, we haven't done as much with rules because we haven't really. It, the challenge is our clients find rules too difficult. We do rules, uh, so I mentioned we've got a couple clients who are using this more to monitor uh, like communities, and they want to see like when people are logging in and people are doing other things, and then we're using rules there um, because there's already Drupal hooks for all that stuff, um, and there's already rules hooks for all that stuff. But a lot of things that we're trying to measure, there's not rules hooks for. So you know, like when someone shares in social, that's really more a part of Addis or you know whatever platform you're using. Um, so it's sort of so we have some integration with with rules. I actually would like to get a few more things, a few more things integrated. But yeah, you can trigger any of these events um, based on a rule that gets triggered in Drupal. Uh, do you have much familiarity with uh, Aquia Lip? Um, I know a little bit about it. Seems like they're kind of uh, attacking a similar problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's gonna, I mean, I think the future, more of what I understand Lyft is more, Lyft is more around like dynamic content, which is actually. The rules side of personalization. Oh, okay, yeah, and I think they're using Kissmetrics for that. Um, and uh, yeah, and actually, so there's, there's a system, um, I, when we kind of started this project, I really couldn't find anything that was like it, which is actually not a good thing. Um, you normally want to find other things that are similar because it kind of maybe means you're on the right track. Um, and, and actually, a lot of this came out of, we found some content, uh, some marketing automation platforms like Marketo and HubSpot were lacking in certain areas, and there's certain data we couldn't get to, and so we, or some of our clients wanted to get to, so we started building this. But, um, so, yeah, um, I know that there's a thing called Aqui Analytics, and it's, it's Kiss Metrics is what it is, which is sort of the same concept. You're tagging visitors, um, and you're moving through. The big difference, though, is it's not integrated to Drupal. You don't get the reports in Drupal. Um, and and does, there is an integration of rules, but you have to set all the rules up yourself. Where, like, you install this, and I mean, there are some things like, you know, if you have ad, you need to have ad this running to do the, the social tracking right now, 
Um, it's just a matter of when we have a client that wants us to do something else. But it, it works automatically. You don't have to sit there and set up all these rules um, to do it. So, and then it works well because like in Commons, they have like all the rules are set up. So if you have a distribution, it's great. But if you have a regular website, now you gotta go figure out how to set up all these rules. And the rules kind of bear to play with. Actually, it's actually one of the kick in the pants when I was trying to do all the rule stuff is all the, J, you gotta have the right version of jQuery and all that kind of stuff. You gotta degrade all your jQuery and all that kind of stuff to get it to work right, which is a lot of fun figuring out like, okay, on this page in our admin, run this version of jQuery, and this page run this. Anyway. Well, like Drew said, at the keynote, you know, make it more complicated on the back end, easier on the front end. Yeah. Automate those rules. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that I said, there's, there's a lot of people are trying to, are, are trying to deal with like dynamic content and so forth. Um, and right now, this is not really a dynamic content platform. It's much more about trying to, it's much more about usability and you know, trying to understand what people are doing, but content, dynamic content will be where we're going with it at some point. Other questions? Oh, okay, please, go ahead. Um, do, you, do you see, I mean, I could see lots of different users um, um, for this. Now, do you see the primary user as the, the content creator um, or the salesperson? Um, or you know, what, what's your vision for some of your primary stakeholders? It, it'll depend on the organization. My hope is everybody's. That is the thing that I think is, is kind of, like there's some really great analytics. If you get into say, say, you know, marketing automation platform, but only the sales team looks at it. And it really, there needs to be, like let's say you are like inbound marketing, content marketing type organization. Um, there needs to be collaboration between the subject matter experts, the marketing team, and the sales team. In fact, HubSpot, we're a HubSpot partner. Um, and um, you know, they, they've taught us uh, marketing, you know, where sales and marketing are together. And so the hope is that there's you know, pieces that the sales team is gonna use more than others. But our hope is that everybody will, in fact, one of the things I actually, I actually got a kick out of is, um, you know, one of, the, one of the little debates we have sometimes is uh, the contrast of fonts. And I'm a little bit of a Jacob Nielsen camp where I like a very high contrast. Um, you know, of course, designers, they like to do these nice grays on a white or something like that. We've had a few people comment on our blog saying, hey, could you turn up the contrast? Um, you know, I'm having a hard time reading it. Well, I want to go see who they are. Because um, I want to know, like, you know, maybe get an idea of, okay, well, how much, how much does this person come to our website? Is the first time they come to our website? You know, those kind of things. And then I want to go to my designer and go, okay, well, okay, these are the types of people that we might be having some usability issues with. And so, you know, that's really the hope is that to take, to take the analytics and the intelligence out of the hands of just a couple of analysts and maybe the salespeople and make it so that everybody's got access to it so everyone can make better decisions. In fact, the, the thing I thought was really fun, um, you know, so like what we do on our blog, um, is we have we ask our developers to blog once a month, and we don't really give them this topics. We're like whatever you're learning, whatever you think is just cool, and you think other people might want to know. So they're writing, and then other people project managers and so forth. And remember when I first got this on our website back like last July, uh, we had this lunch and learn, and several of the developers. I kind of walked into the room, and some of the developers were sitting there going, "Oh yeah, so my blog post got this score. It's like, oh, I'm going to write this topic because I think I'll get this kind of engagement." You know, all of a sudden, like you heard them having conversations they never would have had before. Because um, now, of course, they're gamifying the whole thing around the score. <laughs> but, um, but I was like, hey, that's great. You know, and then, you know, several, you know, for several weeks after that, you hear you know, people going, oh, my blog post got picked up in Reddit, and I drove this kind of traffic, you know. And the other way, oh, my God, the subathon, oh, but the subathon traffic wasn't as valuable. You know, and they didn't engage as much and so forth. And like, those are the kinds of conversations you want to be having with people like really have no background in those kinds of areas. So, Doug, do you have a question? Yes, this is a smorgasbord of very useful data. Anticipate people wanting more bite sized but focused information. Yes, and that's where the R and R report is exactly. And so the idea is, yeah, there there, there does start to become a lot of data. Um, and so you know, kind of going in there and, and spending some time. What we've done is with not a whole lot of time, we can kind of dig through the data and kind of go what's significant um, versus you know what some some of the other things. So that's a little that's a little bit of kind of the, the thought behind the R and R right now. Um, and then you know eventually what we'll have is we'll have the R and R if people want help with their analytics and we kind of have a few different versions or, or levels. Um, but then we'll also have the DIY. You know, you just run the analytics and you can go analyze it yourself. So if I understand right, you have Intel, but then you have R and R. They're actually two separate. So well, R and R is really a service on top of Intel. Okay. So in other words, you have to have Intel, and so it's really just us. Go spending some time to help you analyze the reports, and so then we send you a deck, 
you know, kind of pulling out, you know, different pieces of information, sort of nuggets, okay. if you will. Kind of writing an executive summary. But yeah, it's all based around Intel. Um, it's just, it's one of those things where, to this point, we haven't been really ready, other than our own clients and a few select, you know, a few select people. Um, we haven't really wanted to give out the, the pro version, just we haven't really done a stress test on it yet. And so now we're trying to kind of like taking the next step of we want to get more people involved in the beta. Um, and so that's they're like, oh, this will be kind of a good controlled way. Plus, we'll also get a better handle on the different types of data people are trying to get at and the best way to kind of design reports and segmentation for that. When you said earlier the pricing does possibly be six hundred a month, was that the R and R? That's really R and R, yeah. Probably, you know, right now we're targeting for um, for just the you install it and you pay monthly. It'll be maybe like 120, 150 for a website at say up to a certain volume. Um, right. And then large volume websites might become bigger than that. So the uh, so that yeah, that would be for the R and R report. So that's like getting all the pro version of all the data and then us sending you a report um, each uh, sending you a report each month, kind of pulling out different different nuggets that you find. And yeah, we're doing it. We're doing a, a um, reseller, you know, a partner program around it too, uh, where partners will get a discount on it. And then actually, instead of us going to the client, we would be giving those reports to the uh, to the developer, and then they can figure out like you know if they want to go sell, they, they want to go sell the um, uh, their client more services based around some of these recommendations. They want to filter some of them out, you know, what what, what they want to do with it. So cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks, Robert. Do you, plan on, do you guys plan on doing any uh, uh, Joby work in the future? I'm not sure. Oh, <laughs> um, no, pro probably not. Um, actually, what's interesting is we're talking to someone that does a, they do a, a, an agency that does a bunch of uh, amateur work and they want to move to this because it's just gotten very expensive. They got to get all this stuff all customized. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gotten very expensive to bring the consultant in and do all these custom reports and everything. That makes sense. So, so like a lot of this is hopefully to replace. Yep. Of course, I mean it only works on Drupal. It, you know, so tightly integrated with Drupal. Right. right. But, uh, but for a Drupal website, replacing the need for something like an option. Right. Very cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah, come down and see us. I'll get some people off the demo and show show it. How would it work this month? Um. So generally. It depends. We actually have done like over a month, so um, so we do have stuff. So we're coming out and we're have stuff. Um, mostly, what it does is that you know, it's it's tracking alongside of HubSpot, and then the way we do of like submissions. Like I don't know if you saw that screen, but there was a combination of web form submissions, uh, uh, even discuss comments, comments and submission, and HubSpot submission. So what ends up happening is that with HubSpot, when um, a form is submitted, it hooks in, and that way we capture the person's token. Data sitting in HubSpot, but then we run through that whole sync system that then goes and pulls the data from there, brings it over to Drupal, and then you can modify stuff there and push it back. Um, and so that's the typical scenario that it kind of works side by side as the little market on the platform. Um, there are some other things we've done, like when someone clicks an email back, we're also tracking mainly for like things like someone's on their cell phone. And we want to be able to see tokens across like different devices and email clips are good. So, but um, I would have to look specifically like how the form submission works and so forth. And like even the stuff with like with HubSpot, so you can, like we have, we have another module called CTA module, um, which is on Google Scholar. And you can either put like regular graphics in their pieces, so it's like they're, you know, you can put like a graphic CTA, or you can throw in like a HubSpot CTA, and we've done a little bit of periodic there's your JavaScript. So then it'll track those. There's, so there's, oh, and there's a select for, for, um, for HubSpot, there's a sub module that knows how to do that as the JavaScript to deal specifically with you know, that platform. So, like, if we were to do uh, mark, 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 and we have, we've done market integrations a few years back. We actually haven't done one recently. Um, so we would probably just build a sub module that then would do the special things, like the special form processing um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and help you make it Right, 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 and then that's actually, and that's the other way to go. You know, normally you've got like a JavaScript form that you can embed. The other way to go is, like, that's like the way we run our contact form, and then it's actually very straightforward because the, the system kind of is meant to work really well with web form, 
And so it's almost even easier if you do a web form submission first, um, because then all the data is there, the visitor gets created, all that kind of stuff, and it stores the HubSpot. Like it looks for the HubSpot, because HubSpot has a tracking token too. Um, and so it's looking for that token, it stores that, then it knows how to sync with the HubSpot visitor. Sure. Did you show like a demo or video or something? Like between this and something else, and the other one I was there for a while, we're like, this is not going to help me actually. So, uh, I should probably go over to Intel before I yeah. go over. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I did not, no, I, I, I was run, just running through a presentation. Um, but people weren't happy to show show a demo. You know, like I said, yeah, we got a system set up downstairs. He's, so he's, he's got six monitors downstairs. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to say uh, thanks for all your effort in getting back to the community. Sure. I uh, read your guys' blog a lot. Oh, cool. I've used your SEO modules for years. Cool, cool. You know, gosh, I've really I've got all these updates I gotta get out to. Because we we've been putting a ton of work into the into new distro, which kind of brings together all the SEO stuff, the social media stuff, all this Intel stuff. Yeah. So then I realized, oh I got all these little bugs and like even the keyword research and all that part of an enterprise. Yeah. Is that what it's Open Enterprise Pro is? I know this is one of your services. So, yeah, so here's here's how it's... I was it's trying to, I, you changed it again, I guess, recently, because last time I looked at it, you had something about Intel, but then just Thanks now I looked at it. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got Open Enterprise Appreciate. Pro, Intel, R&R, &R, and Pro almost like it's actually the site, or you it, you set it up so people can build sites, or... Well, yeah, this, it, it's... Yeah, it's a little confusing <laughs> how, how this market... What I need you to do is tell my CFO that. Okay. So, because he changed, he sort of accidentally changed the branding. It's, like, it's a nice layout. I mean, it's, I mean it's no, no, I know. I was, I was actually confused. I was what, like, okay, how so what it's is Open Enterprise Pro? What, what ended up <laughs> happening was actually Intel wasn't really originally called um, Open Enterprise. Intel is level ten intelligence. Yeah, that's um, what I remember. That's yep, what I saw. yep. And then what ended up happening was is that um, the guys organizing the com the the main guy kind of organized this conference, um, or, or you know, doing the work. He has been kind of calling internally OE, OE Intel. And then I remember like one day I said, well, you know, it's not called OE Intel. And like, you know, it's just your internal name for it. I never really corrected him. But then it was like, oh, okay. Hey, Tom. Tom.
They are done in 11. Thank you. Okay, uh,